Good evening, everyone. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you to our Thursday evening Bible study. We are in the Word of God. We've been studying the book of Ezra, so I'm certainly glad to have you here with us today as we're studying. Happy Thanksgiving Thanksgiving to everyone. Uh, had a little problem just getting on, so we're, we're back on now. Uh, just wanted to make sure that you realize that just how glad we are. One of the things that we're thankful for is for you. So we just thank God for you, for your participation, uh, and for all of your support uh, throughout the year. Let's get back to Ezra. We're going to be looking at the book of Ezra, chapter number 5. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. And it reads, Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of God of Israel, who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of uh, Josedek, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you once again for your word. God, we know it's not an accident that we're here and that those that are with us right now are here. But God, by your divine providence, that you have caused us to rise up once again to be able to be attentive and ready to hear the word of God. We just bless you right now for what you're doing, what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you know, the words of the prophets that we are hearing right now, they're coming from Haggai. You know, we also can find these very same words and the, 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 the description of uh, the, the message of the prophet Haggai in the book that is written by him or the book that has his own name. These two prophets were to come together to proclaim a message to Jerusalem. And they didn't come at a time of, you know, uh, you know, great jubilation or exaltation. They came in a time of great depression. This was not a time of, uh, you know, revival for uh, Jerusalem. This was a time when they were really stuck in a place of great complacency. Uh, not a crest or a wave of, you know, just exhilaration. No, they were kind of downtrodden at this point. You know, Haggai rebuked the people in, in his book. He says, uh, he says to them, that it, it, the time has not come, is what you say, that the Lord's house shall be built. And, and Haggai recognized that the people were making excuses about building, excuses about doing the work of God. Obviously, the, you know, we are not dealing with any building of a temple or, or any particular building at all. But we're getting to see the mindset of God concerning the work that he's called the children of Israel to do. The same way that he looks at us concerning the work that we do. And many of us can be just where they are in a place of complacency. But sounding spiritual, you know, when they gave the excuse, it sounded like they were dealing with the timing of God. You know, we're not saying that we don't want to build a house. We're not saying that it's not important. We just recognize it's not time yet. And one of the reasons why they looked at the timing was based upon obstacles. You know, when they looked at it, they said, it can't be the timing of God. This can't be God's will right now because there's certain obstacles in, in our way. There's no way God would be in a move like this where there would be some danger. You know, where we could actually get hurt, where we'd have to put ourselves at risk. Uh, that's not God. That's not the way he works. So we're comfortable that this cannot be the Lord. That they, they you know, And the Lord saw it as well as Haggai comes and says, hey, I've been hearing you and I realize you're making an excuse for your complacency. That, you know, when the prophet comes, he comes to them and he says, he doesn't just say you're complacent. He says, well, look, look at this. Is it a time to you for yourselves? To dwell in paneled houses and this temple of God lie in ruins. You know what he was really dealing with here was their contentment. You know, he looked at the people and recognized you guys are content for the cause of God to really go unanswered. You guys are content to let the, the will of God and the plan of God to actually suffer for, and for the sake of your own comfort. For the sake of your own ability to just kind of lean back and lay back. For, you know, for, for the sake of your own ability to be able to say, listen, there's no adversary that, I can, that I'm having to deal with. There's no pain that I'm having to go through. All of those things to avoid. That, and, and what Haggai was actually talking about was the idea that, hey, this may be uncomfortable. He never dealt with the idea that it was going to be uncomfortable. Haggai says, hey, this may be dangerous. He never once removed the concept of the idea that there would be danger. What he dealt with was their lack of faith and complacency in looking at the mission. They had lost mission-mindedness. They had begun to experience mission creep. You know, one of the things that happens in mission creep is that you can begin to creep over into another lane, into another area uh, that your mission was never intended for. And before you know it, you're doing so many other things that you crept into other areas and now you're off the mark of the original mission. So when you begin to look at this, God dealt with their contentment. 
God dealt with their discouragement, the, the fact that they were absolutely discouraged. You know, when you look at discouragement, something you got to really look at and ask yourselves, what, is the, you know, what are the elements? What are the things that bring about this kind of discouragement? And sometimes one of the things that will discourage people is that you're doing hard work over and over and over again. But you don't see the results that you want. That, that according to your plan, the way that you think it should work, you're not seeing any results. You're not seeing anything that looks fruitful. You're not seeing anything that in your opinion, in your mindset, looks like this is worth it. And sometimes, you know, we abandon the plans that God has given us. We abandon those things that we have told everybody. We know that it's the will of God simply because, man, it's not working anymore. You know what I mean? I was, I was excited about it before. But, but one of the reasons we're excited is because I, I could see some fruit. I could see some things working, but now when I, it, it's difficult to see it, when it doesn't look like it's worth it, now that's when the struggle comes. What do you think uh, it means when Jesus tells the, 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 the disciples, when Paul comes to and tells Timothy, he says, listen, I want you to understand something. You know, preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. You know what that means? That means that God is requiring us and telling us up front that there's going to be a time where the gospel is going to be out of season, that we're going to operate in a moment and a place where we are not popular, where the word of God is not popular, where there's something that people don't want to hear. But the requirement for Timothy was not that Timothy take a sabbatical. It was not that Timothy take a back seat. It was not that Timothy could operate in flesh, that he could defend himself the way he wanted. It wasn't that Timothy could get tired and get sick. No, Paul said, listen, your mandate is to preach the word regardless of what's going on. Your mandate is not connected to the environment uh, or the temperature of the people around you, the temperature of the environment around you. No way. He says, listen, your job is to preach the word and you are to be instant. You are to be ready in season and out of season. You have to be in a state of readiness no matter what's going on. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we get discouraged because we are a little bit, um, I think, a little bit too idealistic. You know, sometimes... It's hard when we, you know, we, we do what we do the work and it seems like the goals again that we have elude us. And every now and then what you have to do is you have to begin to look and say, whose goals are these? Who are you working for? Are you working for you? You know, sometimes our ministries are really about us. They're really about the positions we want to be in. They're, we really can lose the idea of souls being the main thing. The idea that, you know, we're here and designed by God for to be soul saving machines for him. That the reality is that we have a testimony and a praise and a worship that is due God. And we can forget that because now it's about me. It's about how the people treat me. It's about how the people talk to me. It's about the timing that I have. You know, God God's will and my goals are supposed to come together. And every now and then what you'll find is we have to jettison our goals. We have to get away from the way we think that things are supposed to work and overcome discouragement. And one of the ways you overcome discouragement is that there's a fresh encounter that's needed with God. You know, one of the things that you see here is that th there's a call here to get back to work. And in order to get back to work, we need to be able to connect with God right again, once again, trusting him once again to accomplish his will through us. Don't forget that. That's the real goal here is that God wants to accomplish his will through us. That's what God is actually saying to us. I'm going to do something big through you. I want to use you to do something major. And one of the things that God does is that he now begins to connect again. He makes another splash in your life where he is the one who comes. Listen, you know, God could have come and he could have sent an army. He could have sent a lightning bolt. He could have sent angels ready for destruction. You know what he does? He sends a prophet. He sends a word. You know, when you begin to look at this, God gives direct revelation to his people. And when the people heard this revelation that came straight off the presses, they recognized right away that God was speaking to them. They needed another, a, a close encounter with God. And you no, know, there's a lot of ways you can have that. And I'm not going to say, you know, listen, you know, you can't get it this way, you can't get it that way. There's a lot of ways you can have a fresh encounter with God. But one of the things I'm going to tell you that in every single case, you, you must be exposed once again to the word. But if you're going to have every encounter that you have is going to be also an encounter that you must have with exposure to the word of God. Well, and listen, and let me put it this way. In other words, you're not going to have an encounter if you never get into your word. You're never going to have an encounter if you never open your Bible. You're not going to have an encounter if you're not in a position to, to, to hear the preached word of God. Listen, put it this way. Hey, God comes and says to him, he says, consider your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. Listen, 
You can't have this encounter. You can't know how to please God. You can't know the redirection that God has for his people. You can't know the way that he now wants us to go. There's no way that we can be restored in the direction that God wants us to be restored in. Placed back like Jonah without a connection with the word of God. When Jonah was in the belly of the fish for those three days, how did Jonah get out of that situation? It, it wasn't just a matter of God saying, oh, Jonah, you know what? I want you to do my will. No, he, Jonah had an encounter with the Lord inside the belly of the fish. You know, so Jonah needed to be redirected. Jonah needed to get in another in, in the direction and get back on the plan that God has for him. That only happened with a fresh encounter. And I suspect that that's what God wants to do today. You know, with some of you, he wants to have a fresh encounter. You know, and when you begin to look at this, God sending a prophet to get the work started again, God wanted them to stop pretending spiritually. He didn't want them to have pretend spiritual service anymore. He didn't want them to have pretend spiritual power anymore. He didn't want them to allow delays and things that were beyond their control initially, right, to become delays of their own choosing. Now, you know, yeah, it started out something like, man, this was tough. I didn't have any control of that. I, you know, that wasn't my doing. Now the God is saying, well, listen, you're right. Now your job is to persevere, but what you've done is delayed. And now the delay is your choice. Now you've made a, a decision that you want to delay. And so God didn't just send one prophet to come and say, get back on track. You know, I want you to begin to build. I want you to begin to work. He begins to bring Zechariah as well. And one of the beauties here of Zechariah is his name remains the Lord remembers. And when you understand what that is, this is a name about restoration. This is God saying, hey, I remember you. I know the plight. This is not you remember him. This is not God, you know, shaking the, the, the people up and saying, hey, remember me. This is God telling the people, hey, I remember you. I remember my plan. I remember everything that I said. I remember every promise that I made. God, the Lord remembers. What a fitting name for a prophet of restoration. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, that, when you look at what Zechariah is designed to do, Zechariah deals not only with just the building of it, of the, of the, of the building, but Zechariah is encouraging the people to mobilize, to accomplish a task that they had already begun. They had just lost momentum. And the momentum wasn't physical. The momentum was that they, they didn't have the arm power anymore, they, that they didn't have the wood anymore, that the carpenters had moved away. No, you know, they also they had a spiritual impediment. One of the things that you'll see here is that uh, Zechariah comes to warn them spiritually about the consequences of neglecting the work. And it wasn't just a matter of, listen, you, you're going to get in trouble if you don't do what God wants you to do. No, there's another part of this. Zechariah is also now coming to the people and he's letting them know what God wants to do through them in their work. That, listen, you, spiritually, they didn't realize they were missing something. They were missing what God wanted to do through them. That there was something God had in store for them through their work, through their mission, through their ministry. That, listen, when, when, whenever we have a ministry, when we have a mission from God, or there's a plan that's been revealed to us, our thought is the goal. Our thought is accomplishing. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. People, want they get saved, they're going to hear the word. And what we forget is that Paul also said, listen, in preaching, in doing this, not only do I save them, but I save myself. God wants to do a work in you. Your work is directly connected to the work that God wants to do in you. Your success and your diligence and your consistency is directly connected to the diligence and the success that God wants for you in your life. And so when you're hearing this, there's a confrontation that's going on. You know, that, that you know, God wants to do these great things for him, you know, for the people. God, God got big plans for Israel. You know, all these things, you know, with the little, you know, uh, violins they sound great right but like if you go I mean, if you want great things to happen why confront me can you imagine someone saying you know i'm discouraged here why would i want to be confronted with my sin here i am depressed i mean you you admit that you know that i'm down and yet you come with confrontation well guess what confrontation is not pleasant this is this is definitely not something that's going to be easy to swallow god doesn't back off on it because it's the actual medicine that they need why because sin destroys us Sin puts us in a place where we are absolutely separated from God. It damages not only us, but it damages those that are close to us. Listen, when you look at this, there, there was a neglect of worship. There was a neglect of the word. And the Lord was coming to his people, letting them know you don't realize the damage that's occurring when you neglect the word of God. When you step away 
from that which pertains to you. When God is confronting them like a doctor because he knows, listen, I know you're avoiding treatment. Listen, the prognosis is difficult, but the treatment is hard sometimes. Listen, I was talking to somebody recently who had cancer, and they were just talking about how difficult chemo is. But what happens if they don't take it? Listen, can you imagine neglecting the Bible is kind of like a person with um, cancer who is, you know, who knows that, man, the only way to really get healed here is to go through this thing that actually seems sometimes worse than the disease itself. That can be difficult and tough for me to handle. Sometimes being confronted is really a rough, rough thing for us to deal with. It's not pleasant, but it's the treatment that's going to keep us from dying. Listen, when you look at what scripture, scripture is profitable for reproof and correction. It's meant to do that. We're meant to be confronted. We're meant to be in a position where the Lord is looking at us and requiring us to look at ourselves. That's what the confrontation is about. This is only God forcing them to now look at you. That's what happens with us. We don't get healed because we don't want to look at ourselves. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll keep back and hold back, you know, the, the very, very salve and bomb that is designed for us because we just don't want to hear it. But when you look at this, you know, with, by sending Haggai and then sending Zechariah together, God was actually saying, I'm not just interested in your building. I'm not just interested in, you know, what the, what the st things are going to look like. I'm actually interested in your lives. I'm not just interested in building. Part of Sidney Zechariah was to let them know, I'm confronting you because your priorities are changing. And I want your priorities to go back under my leadership. That you slid under from under the leadership of the Lord and back into the leadership of yourself. And now God is calling us back. So what happens here? Well, it says Zerubbabel and, Zo and the son of jo Z Josedek, the Jeshua rather, Zerubbabel and Jeshua, they rose up and they began to build the house of the God. And the prophets were there with them. The work of the prophets here was effective. The confrontation was effective. The people be received it. And guess what happened? They began to rise up and build. They began to reorder their priorities. That's what this Bible study is really all about. It's about God calling us back to work. It's beyond just, you know, what prophetic promises that are going to be there. It's God coming and saying, listen, I want you to be a part of the work that I have. And there's a practical work. And I want you to get back. But that coming back is not just about getting back to work. But this is about repentance. They repented. Turning it, getting back to work is repentance. Stopping is a completely opposite direction from where God has called the people to be. But the moment that we see that they got back to work. That was the moment that we see repentance as well. Listen, repentance isn't just boo-hoo-hoo. I'm sorry. Repentance is getting back to work. You know why? Finishing is a lot harder than starting. The Bible says the end of a thing is better than the beginning of a thing. Through per they, were, they were called to persevere. And guess what God was doing? I'm going to bless you in your perseverance. Without a word from these prophets, without anybody coming, I can imagine they would have really congratulated themselves, even for giving up. Listen, we, we came this far. You know, and sometimes there are people who are patting themselves on the back for giving up, and but compliment themselves that like, yeah, we don't have the temple just yet, but, uh, you know, things take time. You know, listen, man, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, all these cliches that make us feel good in our complacency, that make us feel comfortable in our nothingness. You know, I mean, we're better off today. Like, if you judge us from where we were to where we are right now, man, we've come a long way. You know, at least we didn't go back to the land. At least, you know, oftentimes, how do we do it? We compare ourselves to other people. At least we're not like them. They stayed in the back. We came here and started this. This is harder than people think. God wasn't dealing with cliches. You know, how, is it, how easy is it for us to think that we're okay when we compare ourselves to other people? God wasn't comparing them to other people. He was comparing them to the work that he called them to do. We compare ourselves to other people because it makes us feel better. It makes us feel better about our commitment. But when you get to the word of God, it exposes the intentions of the heart. It exposes who we are. And when we remember that we've been given a mission, and that's what I want you to remember today. You've been given a mission. We have a mission from God. And there's going to be obstacles that are going to be in the way. There's going to be adversity that's going to be in the way. There's going to be trouble. I can promise you that. That's going to try to stand in the way and to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. But what you, begin, what you need to see from this study is that God is able to provide the resources and the strength that we need if we just ask him. And listen, in this situation, God brought it without them asking. You know, we serve a God who answers before we call. So what's the message? Persevere. What's the message? Don't give up. 
I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what things you're struggling with this, this on this Thanksgiving evening, but I, I want you to understand the message that God is trying to let you know I've got all the resources that you need. I've got the empowerment that you need, the strength that you need to go forward. So I want to encourage you today. Persevere. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because there's a work that God has to do in you, but there's a work that God wants to do through you. Listen, I hope that you have an awesome, awesome Thursday. I look forward to seeing you again, and I thank you again for all that you've done. Be blessed today and walk in the righteousness of God. Let's get back to work. Let's turn around. Let's repent, and let's get back in the Word and see this great work that God wants to do through us and also in us. God bless you. Have an awesome Thursday.